Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, sometimes things to come if we figure out what it is. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of The McCartney Legacy. Um, you can see both volume one and the forthcoming volume two right here. Uh, volume two coming out on December 10th. And I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. And he also has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, oddly for <laughs> YouTube channel, but you know. <laughs> I wasn't uh, thinking. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, we're retro. <laughs> uh, and Ken Michaels Radio has tons of Beatles-related interviews on video, and you can check that out. Hello, Ken. How's it going? It's going great. Uh, I'm looking forward to this show. It's a topic that, uh, you know, this, I don't think there's ever been a book just on this particular topic, which makes it even more exciting for me. So I'm really looking forward to discussing it. Well, our viewers who haven't already met our guest will have to wait till after I introduce <laughs> Darren to figure out what that topic was. Um, and my, our second co-host, Darren DeVivo, has been a DJ at WFUV 90.7 in the New York area for the last four decades. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else on the station at W. FUV.org. Hello, Darren. How's it going? Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. And hello, guest. Mystery guest. That hasn't been introduced yet. Mystery guest. Okay. Um, so our mystery guest is Aaron Badgley, the author of Dark Horse Records, uh, the first book about George Harrison's uh post Beatles label Dark Horse, and it's got tons of fascinating stuff in it. Um, it's, a, it's an area that, um, you know, even in Harrison bios, you know, there's a, a little about it, but um, they don't go ever into the depth that Aaron has. Um, he's sort of detailed pretty much every record, not just pretty much every record that Dark Horse put out and the whole story of Dark Horse and um, its relationships with the two larger labels that distributed it. And we'll get to all of that um, after the news. But first, the news with Ken. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, sort of a major news item here, which I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of until, the four of us talked to each other right before this show, but apparently, and it's not official, although probably by the time this gets posted, it will be, but um, it looks like there's going to be a box set coming out of the American Capital Beatles albums, starting with Meet the Beatles. It's six albums, and it takes you through something new. So uh, I guess that means Meet the Beatles, Beatles' second album, a Hard Day's Night, you said, is included? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the early Beatles. Um, let's see. What else? Beatles Story is in there. Right? From what I've heard, Beatles Story, please don't hold me to this. This might not be the way they do it. <clears throat> These albums are coming out individually. They're coming out in a box set. The box set will include the Beatles Story. Okay, and, and the last album in the in the in the in the group is Beatles '65. Okay, and the early Beatles are in there, right. right? Okay, so yeah, as a box set and as individual items, I'm sure for the Christmas market, and uh, we don't have any exact word yet, but that is the rumor. So you might be finding out something as we speak or as you're watching this show. But let's just wait and see and hope that it's true. A lot of people have been waiting for this, especially for the, the big anniversary of 60 years this year. You thought that probably 
they'd be doing it chronologically as each album came out, like Meet the Beatles coming out in January uh, and so on. But uh, it looks like it's going to be this individually, six albums and uh, as a box set, too. All right. And, and Aaron might be uh, might be able to to um, back me up on this. I get the impression that these are going to be the capital masters. These are going to be the heavily processed, echoey, uh, reverb-filled Beatle albums that we got in the 60s on Capitol that did come out on CD on those two box sets. They never did do the third volume. Um, but the U.S. albums CD box set had the albums, but they used the British master tapes, the well, British mixes. According sort to of, the... They, they, if, if, there was, if there was a distinct... U.S. mix, they used that, but mostly they used the British. Okay. Yeah. And this will be in mono. Apparently the box set will be in mono. Right. Hmm. Yeah. I okay. don't know if it's a stereo box set. I, I know that my marriage de will depend on this. <laughs> <laughs> Just the mono would be fine. <laughs> and you, and you got to think that uh, there probably would have to be a second volume. Yeah, I've, I've, I've read that the second volume will have um, everything up through Revolver and then the Hey Jude album. Yeah. Um, you know, and really, if they're going to include the American Revolver, I don't see why they don't include the American Sergeant Pepper. Because the only difference between the American and British Revolver is that it's missing three, the American one's missing three tracks. The difference between the American pepper and the British pepper is that the American one doesn't have the runout groove. So fundamentally, mm -hmm. the, it's it's the same issue. There's no reason why, you know, w why not to release the American pepper or why to release any of them. How many? Uh, just as a, a sort of you know wise ass question um, out there, how many totally worn out copies? of the Beatles story do you think there are? I say none. <laughs> I played it once when I got it. <laughs> you know, I liked it as a kid because I, I mean, it was every time I got to hear the, the Beatles live, uh, that little short snippet. And so they put out the Hollywood Bowl. I used the to play it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, everyone's copy of that may be a little worn out, but. <laughs> I guess it's important to point out just as a matter of history. Mm -hmm. you know. um, so this this is strictly vinyl, right? There's no CDs? I yeah. don't think so. Right. No, vinyl. Okay. All right, then. Um, getting a lot of attention the past few weeks is the new documentary called One to One, John and Yoko, which premiered at the Venice Film Festival and the Telluride Film Festival a couple of weekends ago. Directed by Kevin McDonald, the project follows John and Yoko in the first year and a half uh, when they moved into New York City. And it features archival footage of interviews and phone calls combined with concert and archival footage. And uh, there's no word that I've heard yet about showing it in movie theaters or a DVD or Blu-ray yet. Uh, Ringo Starr just started his fall tour with the All-Stars in the U.S., a total of 12 dates running from uh, September the 7th through the 25th. And a new press release says, look for details on Ringo's forthcoming country album next month. Looking forward to that. Um, that'll be coming. Oh, the, the details will be in October. And Book Johnson is replacing Edgar Winter in the All-Stars. Buck Johnson has been with Aerosmith on tour. He's a guitar player. Don't know too much about him. But um, yeah, apparently Edgar Winter is not in the current lineup. Do we know why? I don't know why, but I had heard that previously he had, he had had COVID, which was why he missed dates on the last leg of the tour. Um, yeah, haven't heard an official word why this time. Um, yeah, but Ringo back on the road right now as we speak. Congrats to our colleague and friend Ken Womack for receiving the McCann Book Award 
for his biography, Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mal Evans, which has won the Music Book of the Year Award. Ken was presented with the award during Beatle Week in Liverpool during the August bank holiday. In response, Ken commented, I am truly humbled by the team at McCann's selection of Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mal Evans. Um, as Music Book of the Year, sharing this story would simply not have been possible without the warmth, goodwill, and support of Gary Evans and Julie Rossow, Mal's children. Their courage and insistence on telling, telling Mal's story, warts and all, demonstrates their unfailing approach to getting their father's life and times right. Uh, thank you again for this important recognition, and thanks to the 910, 910PR, for this information. A brand new book comes out October the 1st called George Harrison, Within You, Without You, Listening to George Harrison by Seth Rogovoy. I guess that's how you pronounce his name. Within You, Without You is a highly personal exploration of George Harrison's essential contributions to the Beatles and his solo work, as well as his significant role as a Western proponent of Indian music and beliefs. Through close examination of his guitar playing in the Fab Four and his songwriting, both in and out of the Beatles, author Seth Rogovoy demystifies the enigma of this most reluctant of rock stars. Drawing upon the insights of the author, who's a rock critic and historian of over 40 years standing, as well as those of expert observers, including Beatles filmmaker Michael Lindsay Hogg, and English rock singer-songwriters Robin Hitchcock and John Wesley Harding, among others, this book extensively examines George Harrison's contributions to the musical world. Within You Without You will forever change the way readers hear the music of the Beatles and view Harrison's role in the group, as well as enhancing appreciation of Harrison as a cultural figure above and beyond his work as a musician. Uh, thanks to John Bazzini and Patrick Humphreys, who's the author of the new book, called with the Beatles for this. But do they cover anything about the Dark Horse record label in this book? Probably not. That's why we have our special guest here. <laughs> Another book that's a nice surprise. Get this. It's called Dip My Brain in Joy, My Life with Neil Innes. It's written by Yvonne Innes, Neil's wife. It's due on October the 24th, described as the official biography covering Neil's career with the Bonzo Dog Duda Band, Mighty Python, and the Ruddles. Jude Sutherland Kessel will be putting out the sixth volume of her biography on John Lennon with heavy detail on each time period in John's life. The next volume will be called Shades of Life Part Two and is the first uh, it covers the first eight months of 1965 in the lives of John and the Beatles, The Making of Help and its soundtrack, John's second book release, the 1964 European tour of France, Italy, and Spain, the furor over the Beatles MBE nomination, and so much more. It is expected out next March. You can pre-order her book at her website called johnlennonseries.com. Apparently, we've heard that Paul McCartney had a big part in talking both Liam and Noel Gallagher into reuniting Oasis. Paul has talked to both brothers and told them they both would regret not getting back together while they still have the ability and means to pull it off. Paul also spoke about the fact that he has lived to regret that the Beatles never got back together for one last hurrah before John Lennon was killed. So if you're an Oasis fan, you can... Partly thank Paul for this happening, so he says. Uh, we did speak on our last show about a new tour happening called It Was 50 Years Ago Today. Actually, this has been a series of concert tours in which uh, Superstar and Lineup perform their own hits. Half the show is their own hits, half is Beatle music. And they usually honor a couple of Beatles albums in the process. This time... This group will be covering the Let It Be and Hey Jude albums, an American album there. They probably got wind of this box set coming out. And right now there is a website which lists all their upcoming shows. Uh, the lineup includes Christopher Cross, Joey Mullen, and Jason Sheff. They were in the last lineup. And uh, in fact, Danny Lane was part of that lineup too. Uh, Maxie Priest is part of this. And just added is David Pack from Ambrosia 
brilliant artist right there, um, who I guess is replacing Glenn Shorrock. They had mentioned his name from the Little River Band, so I guess he's not in the lineup. But if you want to see a list of all the dates, you can go to it was 50 years ago today.com, and that's five zero. Don't spell out the word. It was 50 years ago today.com, and tickets have already gone on sale for that. The new movie of Minecraft, um, described as an American adventure movie based on the 2011 video game, is due out next year. And a teaser for the film includes the Beatles recording of Magical Mystery Tour. The film stars Jason Momoa, Emma Myers, Emma Myers and uh, Jack Black. Thanks to Kevin Martin for that. Uh, there will be a Beatles festival in Charlotte, North Carolina on October 4th and 5th. There will be performances October 4th by the Tosco Beatles Music Tribute and October 5th by Live and Let Die, the music of Paul McCartney. That, I've heard, is an excellent band. Tony Kishman plays the role of Paul McCartney. He looks a lot like him, too. And uh, if you're fans of the Weaklings or the band Liverpool, that's the Beatles tribute band that always performs at the fest for Beatles fans, John Marjavi has been in this group. He's the George guy in both those bands. Um, this weekend of October 4th and 5th will feature guest speakers, including my colleague, Kid O'Toole from Talk More Talk, a Beatles art contest, Beatles, a Beatles cover song contest, yoga, and more. For more information, you can visit fabfestcharlotte.org. A few more things here. We have documentary news. Elton John has a new documentary film on his life called Never Too Late, which captures him in his heyday in the 70s in the most revealing way, leading up to his farewell concert at Dodger Stadium. Uh, in which they cover Elton's relationship with John Lennon and one moment when they are partying with, quote, mountains of coke. When a knock came on their hotel door, and it was Andy Warhol. They wouldn't let him in because he was always carrying a Polaroid camera and they didn't want their use of drugs to be captured. This documentary is due to be aired on Disney Plus in December. Did you want to say something, Aaron? No. Oh, I thought was, I just so found crazy. that amusing. Oh, OK. <laughs> and speaking of documentaries, there'll be a new one on Paul Anka. It's uh, called Paul Anka My Way, which just premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. Are you there for that, Aaron? Uh, I didn't get my invitation. I'm a bit upset. I, um, Paul Anka, you fine Canadian man. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I thought you'd attend all those. He wow, must be calm yes. for all those festivals. <laughs> In it, he tells the story how he never heard of the Beatles until he saw them perform in France. When they were announced as the Beatles, he said, Beatles, what the hell is that? He noticed that they played artists from the 50s that he had worked with, like Fats Domino and Chuck Berry, and that they were totally influenced by American blues. He told his agent about the Beatles. Anka's agent happened to be Sid Bernstein. So I guess he kind of tipped him off about the Beatles. Although you've always heard Sid's story that he found out about them from reading, you know, newspapers from England and finding out that they were a big sensation. I never heard Sid bring up Paul Anka and all this. But Anka is quoted as saying, when they came over, I realized things were changing. I realized if I didn't change with it, I wasn't going to survive it. And I just started really laying into my songwriting, trying to reinvent myself, knowing I'd be left behind if I didn't. And how'd that work out? What's You're that? having my baby. <laughs> Don't... That was in the 70s. <laughs> hey, he made a big comeback in the 70s. Yeah. That was his song, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. That's what I did. I thought, oh, no. no, no that's... That's... Yeah. As was Times of Your Life. Which they yeah. know that commercial. Yeah. Uh, hey, he's, he's very talented. He's written a lot of hits. Yeah. He, people. She's a lady for Tom Jones. Saw him in concert just recently. He's 82. I think he's the same age as Paul McCartney. Sounds phenomenal. Really strong voice. But actually, Paul Anka from the very beginning was writing a lot of his hits from Diana on. But um, he concentrated more on the, the songwriting end of it when the Beatles hit it big just like Neil Sedaka did. 
Didn't he write the Tonight Show theme? Yes, he did. Oh, wow. My Way. Yeah. So, yeah. That's right. He wrote My Way. Um, What's the other Frank Sinatra? Let Me Try Again. Mm -hmm. Great ballad from Sinatra and Paul Anka wrote that too. Um, He does all those songs live if you see him in concert. Some major passings here to discuss. The great bassist, Herbie Flowers, has died at the age of 86. He played bass on Paul's great ballad, No More Lonely Nights, and also from the Give My Regards to Broad Street album, Paul's version of The Long and Winding Road. He also played on Ringo Stop and Smell the Roses album on the songs Rack My Brain. He also played the tuba on that as, as well as the bass. And he's also on You Belong to Me, so the, the George Harrison tracks on Stop and Smell the Roses. He shares bass work and is listed for tuba as well on George Harrison's Somewhere in England album. He also shares bass on the Gontrapo album. Classic songs that Flowers played bass on include Space Oddity by David Bowie, Walk on the Wild Side, that familiar bass line by Lou Reed, Rock On by David Essex and Harry Nilsson's Jump Into the Fire. Oh. Burby Flowers, dead at 80. Those are some legendary riffs. Oh, yeah. Right there. You know, <laughs> Walk on the Wild Side, the whole song revolves around that bass yeah. line. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually Darren alerted me to this, um, although I would have found that anyway, but uh, we note the passing of Sergio Mendez. Mm. Um, has been described as a bossa nova uh, legend, Brazilian. He died on September the 5th after a long battle with COVID. Um, But he covered quite a number of Beatles songs, including Day Tripper with Little Help from My Friends. One of my favorite of all Beatle covers, The Fool on the Hill, which was a top 10 hit in 1968 for them, Norwegian Wood, and Here Comes the Sun. A reminder uh, some theatrical showings. We have One Hand Clapping appearing in theaters on September the 26th. And as we noted in our last show, some theaters are running it more than the one day. So check your local listings for that. Daytime Revolution, which covers the week that John and Yoko co-hosted the Mike Douglas show. That is supposed to be happening in theaters on John's birthday, October 9th. And I hope this is accurate. I've been given October 10th for the movie on Brian Epstein called Midas Man. And finally, uh, Julian Lennon's new photo book called Life's Fragile Moments was due to have been released yesterday. All righty. That's all the news. Or as I sometimes say, oh no news. (laughs) Okay. Um, So, as I said at the beginning, we're going to be speaking with Aaron Badgley, uh, the author of this book about the Dark Horse label. And I mean, I guess the first obvious question is what led you to decide to do a book about the Dark Horse label? Well, you know, I've, I've read tons of books and yours is one of them, which is brilliant. And all you guys are, I said, I'm a big fan of you all, but Every time I read a book about Harrison, they kind of went Beatles, All Things Must Pass, Bangladesh, you know, somewhere in England, and then Cloud Nine. And there was this huge section of his life that was seldom covered in books. And I I wanted to read about it. So I started doing some of my own research just out of, you know, curiosity. And it, it evolved into a book. And it, it, it was just really because I felt that this was a an area of his life that really deserved a little bit of a spotlight because... It, well, a, a, I, I mean, I find it interesting. And B, you know, it, he worked really hard. 74 and 75, he really devoted time to that label and those artists. And um, so, yeah, that's why, I mean, just really to shine a light on a certain time period. I guess the, um, you know, the genesis of it actually has something to do with Apple, really. Um, you know, George and to, I think, a lesser extent, Ringo, but the two of them, really wanted to keep the Apple label going as a label. Um, But that became untenable for a number of reasons. And I guess that led George to think of doing the same thing on his own, right? Is that that basically how you 
see it. Well, he wanted to, you're absolutely right. Him and Ringo wanted to take over Apple, but all the lawyers, it kind of reminds me of that Ruddle scene where all the lawyers are stumbling out of the room. But um, they, they said, don't do it. You, it's more complicated. You, you'd be best to just start your own label. But it all started because of Mal Evans, really, because Mal introduced what became Splinter to George. And they performed a song in a film he financially backed, Little Malcolm and his struggle against the Unix. They did a song called Lonely Man. And Harrison wanted to put that out as a single on Apple, but Apple was collapsing. And also, one half of Splinter was already on Apple. He did the vocals for John's uh, God Save Us, right? And um, so he, Apple couldn't put it out, and Harrison thought they were too good to kind of let drift away. Ironically, Lonely Man isn't on the first Splinter album, nor is it their first single. That It appears on their second album. And um, it was such a successful song in Japan, they actually recorded it in Japanese. And, try, and, and I have that single, it's quite interesting. But that song was the, the, the genesis of doing the Dark Horse label. And what, he was actually talking to Leon Russell. And Leon Russell had his record label, Shelter Records, and said, you know, George, it's, you don't have to make it as big as Apple. It can be small, and you can really devote time to the artist. So he spent 18 months with Splinter recording their first album. While he was doing that, he thought, well, I should put Ravi on, because Ravi had, was doing this thing, Music Festival from India, which was the first thing he recorded, Ravi, for Darkers. But that didn't come out until the second Ravi Shankar album. The first one was... Uh, Shankar Family and Friends, which is, I think, a classic album. And um, so he was working on these two albums while he was working with Ringo and Ringo and, you know, living in the material world. So it was a very busy time, but that was the genesis, was was he really wanted to support Splinter, and he thought they were good, and he thought they could make it big. He, he His logic was they could promote the film, and the film can promote them, put the single out, it'll be a big hit. Not, not bad logic. Right. And so he did that. So he looked for a deal and he got the deal with AM Records. And I, I was fortunate to talk to a couple of people from AM about that deal. And it was interesting. It was very eye opening, you know. Um, what about it was eye opening? Well, they, you know, they really signed their course because they thought they'd have Harrison. They really didn't. They liked the music, but the, the, the other artists were irrelevant, really, not irrelevant, but they weren't that important to AM Records. Mm -hmm. They thought he had a beetle, and, and they knew that his contract to Apple, EMI, Capital, was coming up in 75. This was 74, and they it was written into the contract that at 75, he would join the A&M roster. And, um, you know, the, the person, I, one of the people I spoke to was doing promotion, and he, he was very funny. He said, you know, I'm sitting in this room with George, and he's saying, well, we, we got to make Music Festival from India top 10 album. Okay. You know, like he just said. It was these expectations, um, but but A and M really signed a Beatle. They didn't really sign. Dark Horse was kind of an added bonus. Now I think once Splinter took off in the UK, they thought, well, maybe we got something here, and they did work really hard with Harrison in promoting the bands in the UK. And A and M in the States had a huge, huge office, so it was very interesting. Um, you say that. Um... The Harrison aspect of the Dark Horse deal, apart from that it was his label, but but the idea that he would be then recording for it was something that was kept secret when the label was first announced. That's right. Why, why do you think they did that? I mean, it, it, it obviously wasn't going to happen before he was out of his EMI contract. Um, so it's not like EMI could have sued them because it was clearly for later. Why do you think, um, you know, both from, I can see why from George's point of view, he might want to keep it secret in case he had other options he wanted to explore, but why Why from A&M's point of view would they have kept it secret? Well, I think for that same reason, I think Harrison wanted it kept secret, so they kept it secret at his request. That's what Derek told me, was that it was really, Harrison insisted that this not be announced because... I don't know that Harris, I think Harrison wanted to test the waters with a and to be perfectly frank. And um, Warner Brothers offered him a much nicer deal. They, re they really did. So, I mean, that whole transition from a and to Warner Brothers was not handled well in, a, in a, the best of ways. And unfortunately, the bands kind of got in the crossfire. I, the example I always used was uh, Attitudes. Sweet Summer Music was actually 
sailing up the charts, uh, doing extremely well, getting airplay. I went through Billboard and there were, it was being added all over America. And then he left A&M and literally A&M just pulled the record. So it went from like, mm -hmm. like 90, 80, 66 off, which is not typical of a, a chart. You know, it's usually, but they just, A&M got very upset. Then they sued Harrison and... Um, I got that great interview clip where Harrison's talking and he said, you know, I feel more like a lawyer than I do a musician these days. So, you know, he was, he had the My Sweet Lord lawsuit, he had the Dark Horse lawsuit. It was a tough time in 76. Um, it's funny because before I read your book, when we were um, researching volume two, um, you know, we sort of keep tabs on what the Beatles are up to, you know, just peripherally, because it is part of Paul's life in a way, you know, and becomes more so. Um, but I remember running into the news that uh, that A and M was suing Harrison for non delivery of his own albums, and I thought, you know, I I never heard I never heard about that. I never heard when when he went to. Uh, when he started Dark Horse, that they were expecting him. Uh, I mean, it makes sense now that now that you think about it, but it had never been announced. Um, no. And uh, so then, when I read your book and, and it confirmed that it had never been announced, it it sort of helped clarify some of that. Um, I should pass you on to Ken next, and we'll do we'll go around. Okay. Um, just to clear things up, George signed with A&M in 1974, right? He didn't sign, A&M signed, uh, Dark Horse signed with A&M, so right. he, he actually, but, but it's interesting, Ken, is that there is, a, there was a, a clause, and it actually laid out the royalties for Dark Horse and George Harrison Solo, and in A&M's mind, he had signed with them. In Harrison's mind, he didn't, um, but he signed to the point that, you know, there was an album that was due in 76. It was due by this date. He didn't deliver it for many reasons. And that was their their go-to to sue. So okay. It just seemed kind of odd that that AM would sign in 74 and not expect an album from George for two more years, which in those days, you expect an album from an artist every year. So well, I asked that question when we spoke to Derek from AM and he said, you have to go back in time in 74. Um, Material World had made number one. Red Rose Speedway had hit number one. 67 to 70, 62 to 66 were both number ones. Um, even Ringo hit number two on Billboard, number one on, on Cashbox. The Beatles were still big, and labels were really willing to do just about anything to accommodate getting a Beatle on their label. Everyone knew that Harrison was unhappy with capital EMI. I mean, it was it was really he was very clear about that. I mean, to the point where when McCartney signs to Capitol in 75 and Harrison goes, good luck to him. I mean, it, it was it was clear that he wasn't happy with Capitol EMI. So I think it, it made sense in that in that way, because the Beatles were still huge. And so they'd only been apart for three or four years. I mean, depending on what date in 74. Oh. And um, they were still making the news, selling records. They were charting. They were huge. So. A and M, I think, thought they were into a good thing here, and I, I, and they knew that he had two more albums to deliver to Capital, which would be Dark Horse and Extra Texture, Extra Extra Texture. We'll read all about it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was it was an interesting record deal. Um, I, I I don't think I've ever read any other record deal quite like it. Um, you know, Ringo signed with Polydor Atlantic, Polydor the entire world, Atlantic in North America after he left Apple, but but he actually signed Ringo Records to Polydor Records in 74 as well. So it was happening. It was it was it was an interesting time period and there was some interesting record deals going on. Okay, since you mentioned this just a few moments ago, uh the single of God Save Oz or God yes. Save Us. Um did Bill Elliott being on that record have any influence on the fact that George wanted to work with Splinter, or was it strictly on the basis of Lonely Man being in the film, Little Malcolm? It was it was really on the basis of Lonely Man being in the film. He he knew of the song by John because of Mal. So Mal actually played him John's record. So this guy's got a great voice. He's in this band called Half Breed. Uh, and they changed their name very smartly to Splinter. 
And um, that that was it. I mean, he didn't, because there's an interesting comment. There's a great comment when the, Lennon actually plays Splinter on the radio in New York City. And he makes an off the cuff comment, goes, Oh, that, you know, that's what just sounds like George, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he actually says, you know, I worked with Bill on another single a few years ago. But it was really George's love of um of Lonely Man and and Mel's kind of pushing because remember Mel brought Bad Fingers. Well, didn't brought he produced Brad Fingers no matter yeah. what. He's been on a bit of a role there. So yeah, it was it was really that. Interesting. You know, uh, on this show uh, and my other podcast show, often we we refer to Splinter's first album, The Place I Love, as the great lost George Harrison album. Not to take anything away from the talents of Splinter, mind you. Same thing as the McGear album is like a McCartney album, yeah. in a way. Um, but if you listen to The Place I Love, it, it they all sound like they could be George Harrison songs. Of course, he's got his fingerprints all over it playing on it and producing it and having all his friends on there and you talk about how involved george was especially with splinter and what i wanted to bring up in just reading this book in general is how similar the stories are of apple and dark horse oh, because yes. both labels are extremely eclectic it's the artists in the case of apple that the the four beatles wanted to sign yeah. in some cases friends of theirs and the music is really all over the place on apple i don't think the beatles were aware necessarily of what would sell commercially and they were very disappointed in certain albums on apple that didn't go that well i mean when we listen to apple records now we're amazed at how good a lot of that stuff was that just fell from the cracks there you know aside from a few Badfinger releases and Mary Hopkins, those were the days and postcard. Most of the Apple stuff didn't sell. Only the Beatles and solo Beatles stuff did. And I think that George picked a lot of music that he truly loved, like mm -hmm. Ravi Shankar, and maybe he didn't have the ear for what would sell. Great musician, not necessarily thinking like a businessman, like, you know, someone that works at a record company. And I'm sure he was really disappointed with, the lack of sales at Dark Horse. I think he was. And I think, and I kind of try to put this in a context in the book, is that some of the stuff I don't understand why it didn't sell. Like mm -hmm. if you work out what was popular, say in 77, and yeah. you know, and Splinter puts out the two-man band album, and it's really well produced. It's very AM friendly. It should have, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it should have been at least top 50. Um, and I think he was disappointed. I think he, and you, you remember that story where he wrote a letter to Capitol Records with uh, London Derek Van Eaton single, yeah. saying, you know, what's going on, guys? Why isn't this in the charts? And he was, he firmly believed in his artists. And I think you're, you know, I don't know that he was a great businessman. I mean, even even to the to the extent of his own solo career, like where he wouldn't do an interview for Gon Trapo, he just thought it would sell because his name was George Harrison. But he, I think he really liked. I really believe he loved all the music. He, 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 Olivia has said as much about attitudes that there was this, he loved the music that, mm. you know, that's, and that's kind of a super band. It's got David Foster, Jim Keltner, you know, I mean, it's like it's a cooch on guitar. I mean, it's a super band, really. Right. Not at the time, <laughs> but now. Um, so yeah, I think that the music was kind of, it just kind of, you know, when I interviewed Jiva, and the, my, my favorite comment was, I said, well, I'm surprised you guys didn't make it bigger. And he said, well, Aaron, you know, Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Wonder, Jackson Brown, Eagle. And he's just sort of listing off all the stuff. It was hard to get heard on the radio in those days. Um, but, you know, like you said about, as you said about Apple, I think when you go back and revisit some of these albums, Henry McCulloch's album, I was surprised how fantastic that album is. I, I was really shocked how good that is. You know, it's like a, like a Rory Gallagher meets you know, whatever pop album, it's, it's a really strong album. Um, and maybe the, a single off that would have been good. <laughs> no single. But, Aaron, which which album did you just mention you were talking about? Henry McCulloch. Henry's Marjorie. album. Okay. Yeah. Great album. I mean, fantastic yeah. album. I, I, it, it's FM friendly. It, it's got a great sound, got a great groove. He's a great guitarist, as we all know, from well, Wings and his 
own solo stuff and and um, the Grease Band and things like that. So yeah, it was great music, and I think Harrison really believed in all the artists, and and I, I think it must have very impacted him very much. Now, who was the the promotion guy at uh, for Dark Horse? You A and M. Who was it? Derek Green. Okay, so do you believe that there wasn't enough promotion for this music? Because you do say George put a lot of effort in the promotion. You know, I it, it's funny you ask that. I I I think that it was maybe the wrong promotion, if that makes sense. I mean, I, but then again, I'm going to argue with myself. I do this often. My wife says I have the greatest conversations by myself. <laughs> but, but I mean, he got. You know, Splinter opened up for Cher, and they opened up for the Kinks. He got Jiva to open up for Dark Horse. But that's him. That's not A&M doing a whole lot. And um, I remember, again, talking to one of the members of Jiva, saying, you were opening for Fleetwood Mac. And he goes, yeah, Aaron, but you go into the store downtown. You're playing with Fleetwood Mac that night. You walk in, there was no Jiva albums. There was no posters. It didn't matter. We didn't exist. It was Fleetwood Mac, you know? Yeah. Um so I, I I don't know that A and M really knew. You you mentioned earlier about the the eclecticness of the the label. I don't know what they if they knew how to deal with it, because you got an English folk rock band, you have an L A rock band, you have uh, an Irish blues guitarist, you have Indian music, you have you know it's it's just you have some some jazz. You have the Stair Steps who came out of nowhere who reunited. Mm -hmm. Which should have been a huge news story. These guys were big in the early seventies. They reunited. Kenny Burke. Everyone's back. It's just, and I, I talked to Alvin Taylor about this, and and he he said it was he was devastated. So it was Billy Preston that the album didn't do well. He, they thought it was going to be huge, but they also thought that Harrison would put money out, or not Harrison. Sorry, sorry. A and M would give money to do the a tour, and they wouldn't. A and M refused to back tourists. So Harrison either backed them. Or they backed themselves, but A and M would did not give money for tours. So that's I don't know if that answers your question, but maybe if A and M backed some of these tours and they had, and, and attitudes had done some club dates, or you know maybe it would have been different. I don't know. I'm trying to understand. A and M didn't back tours, so the the major A and M artists that were on A and M they didn't they, back their tours. No, they backed those tours, but it wasn't part of the contract with Dark Horse because Dark Horse. In A&M's mind, it was, work, it was a separate entity from A&M proper. Okay. So they said, well, George, you own Dark Horse. So if you want them to tour, you're the you're the CEO. You pay for it. And George was, yeah, but you're distributing it. And they it, it got kind of, and that could have been one of the reasons Harrison left Warner Brothers, or A&M. You know? Did he have a big problem with Green? No, he loved Green. Green was, Green, Green became his very good friend, and, and he... He appreciated Green told me some great stories about about going to George's house and, and vegetarian dinners. And he would, you know, Harrison would talk to him for a couple of hours before they even had a meeting. Um, just having a really nice time with George. And George felt that Derek was trying his best to get the music out there, but it was being met with a lot of obstacles. And he would explain to George, George, AM isn't going to pay for this, you know, um, which is one of the reasons he took Ravi on tour with him in 74 because he thought while i'm touring i'll pay for ravi a and m had nothing to do with that tour although they were promoting shanker family and friends so that, that that's a really good example there where he footed the bill all right yeah he also snuck in splinters music over the pa <laughs> during the tour there you know <laughs> but you know yes. I, I i read towards the end of your book how you felt that the methods of promotion might have been dated you know, instead of just putting out a single and expecting radio stations to play it, maybe because of George's affiliation or something like that. George was very much involved with the promotion, but I think you said that the, the method of promoting it was not, it had changed. The industry had changed. So in what way, other than what you were just saying about A&M treating Dark Horse like a separate entity? The music, the music industry was. If you look at this, the late seventies, the the industry was changing in ways that it wasn't enough just to put a single out, then put the album out and and hope for the best. It was, you know, this is when rock radio was coming into its own. There was rock shows, interviews. Um, if you look at what artists were doing in the UK, they were putting out stuff through BBC, John Peel, 
They were doing concerts. They were doing interview albums. They were making themselves available. And, you know, I don't know that Harrison made his artists not available. I scoured magazines looking for interviews with Kenny Burke. Not a lot out there. And and so that was changing. The also in, in the UK and Europe, promotional films were becoming very important. Mm-hmm. And even Ringo was, you know, look at Roto Gavier. He did four films for that album in 76. Um, there wasn't, there was no promotional films. You didn't see Splinter on Midnight Special or Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. Yeah. Uh, visual was starting to come in. And uh, the other thing that was happening too was that radio was splintering a lot. See, you know, and you know, it's really splintered now, but back then you could see the FM stations were playing this, AM, and, and the, and certain FM stations wouldn't play this, they wouldn't play, you know, blah, blah, blah. But he wasn't kind of, I, for whatever reason, there wasn't the promotion going on, even for his own solo records, that got him on the right radio stations and the right interviews. And if you look at um, 33 to 3rd, he really put himself out there. He he toured doing interviews. He did three promotional films. He was in all the magazines. And he felt that the album didn't do as well as he had hoped because it only peaked at number 11. Well, you know what? It still did amazing. And it went gold. And it had two hit singles in America. And so when, when George Harrison, George Harrison came around, he did three interviews. That was it. And he put out Blow Away with a great video. And then Love Comes to Everyone. He just thought, well, <clears throat> I got good reviews, so we'll just put it out. Stations didn't touch it for whatever reason. I don't have an answer. But he, McCartney, you know, and Alan, you can speak to this more than I can, but McCartney really knew how to play the game. To this day, he's the master at, at promotion. You know, I think I say in the book that, you know, at one point McCartney released how many versions of, of No More Lonely Nights? And Harrison wasn't doing that. He did, what, the 12-inch single of Got My Mind Set On You, the box set, and the seven-inch. You oh. know, but McCartney had, I don't know, 100? <laughs> A lot of remixes. So, you know. Okay. Well, I'm reminded of George later on in life he would say the idea of recording music and making music is what he loves but promoting it he's not crazy about or being forced to promote himself um anyway let's uh move on to darren um i i see two similarities between what was went on at apple and what went on with dark horse talented artists that had commercial potential and yet at Apple, whether uh, whether or not uh, the presence of Alan Klein affected everything, but I mean, you had James Taylor, who they were convinced was going to be big. It didn't, you know. I know. Again, I don't know how much Alan Klein played in specifically stalling James Taylor's pr- progress, um, but. He probably did have some impact there and Peter Asher leaving Apple then seeing the writing on the wall that Alan Klein was in the picture and he brings James Taylor with him but still there was enough time I think there for James Taylor to make some noise on the charts as an Apple act and then you have Badfinger well all right they did they enjoyed a great deal of success but at the same time Apple was like an was like an albatross in a way to, to Badfinger um after a while they couldn't get the time of the day from the label anymore and that went on and on right down to lon and derek van eaton i always think of lon and derek van eaton's brother album for apple and splinter together because they were similar sort of singer songwriter pop um musically different the same difference a duo beatlish didn't sell Splinter did a little bit, but um, so there seems to be something here that you would think that Apple, the Beatles, anything they touch is going to be gold, wasn't the case. Same thing with Dark Horse, wasn't the case. Um, That something behind the scenes, as we've been discussing, was going wrong uh, with the closed door, you know, meetings about promoting these acts. 
Well, I think part of his promotion, I think the other thing is that, that two artists raised this issue with me. Actually, so did Henry McCulloch's manager, that you, you used a really cool term. You said Apple was a bit of an albatross to Badfinger. Being on Dark Horse became an albatross to these guys because what they were met with was a lot of, well, yeah, you're only getting played because you're, George Harrison produced you. It's not because you're good, because Harrison produced you. And there was that kind of attitude where the, the bands are starting to experience it. It's like, well, you know what? You're opening for Fleetwood Mac because Harrison's good friends with Mick Fleetwood. No other, not that you deserve to. So there was a, the, I think there was that happening too that no one talked about. Certainly, you know, when I talked to Derek, he said, yeah, in England, there was a huge pushback about, so what? George Harrison produced it. So what? You know, that, you know, but, but he said to me, you know, but if, if Steel Ice Span had put out uh, China Light, it would have been a top 10 hit. And I, I don't disagree with them, but because it was on Dark Horse, because George played guitar, because George produced it. And I think, you know, when you have an advertisement, and I think it's in the book, it's where, you know, the band or the producer, there's George with Splinter. It was like, okay, so what's going on here? Is this Splinter or is this a, an option? Of, uh, is this George Harrison and Wings? Um, you know, and it wasn't, but again, perception is is what matters. Because when you go through and you read Billboard and Record World and, and Radio World and Cashbox, it's like this song should be a hit. Maximum mayhem play on this single. It didn't get it. And it didn't happen, yeah. I think you, you said that it was a bit of an albatross for, for Badfinger. I really think it was. And I think that, do you remember Badfinger used to be compared to the Beatles all the time? You know, they say, oh, well, they're like the Beatles, come and get it. Well, yeah, McCartney wrote it and produced it. And sure, it sounds like a bit Beatley, but it's whatever. Um, so there was that aspect too, which is kind of confusing. But then again, when you think, don't you think it's happening with James and Julian and Sean trying to make their name the solo artist, but said, wow, look at your last name. Of course, you're going to get a record deal. Of course, you're going to get a record out. Mm -hmm. So there was that piece too, that 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 when I talked to Bill Elliott, uh, he said, you know, it went, maybe didn't get into press, but certainly when you would talk to someone, they'd say, wow, you know, good for you for signing to Dark Horse because you're guaranteed this. And these were it was actually the opposite. So you That's had a quote, I, I think, from um, it may have been Jeeva's manager or, some, or someone um, basically saying, yeah, you know, we, we decided to go with Dark Horse, worst business decision ever. <laughs> <laughs> and that I think is the same albatross idea, you know, that that it it looks great in principle. Go be on a Beatles label, but then when you get there, it it doesn't necessarily uh, involve the magic that was promised, you know. Well, yeah, and I think that's a really good good point, the magic, because it's like the magic's going to rub off, and 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 uh, I, you know, there's this high expectation. I think, like I was just reading because I'm researching my next book it's on Ringo yes Ringo records is three chapters but you know there's this a big build-up about you know David Henschel's albums coming out he's from Genesis and and uh it's a synth album of Ringo and her singles oh my my and all this it didn't do a, a darn thing right it didn't sell it didn't get played and I don't think WNEW in New York was playing it I doubt it but you know Ringo Records has an even worse track record. I mean, mind you, they had one number one in Australia, but uh, they had Graham, bon Graham Bonnick doing a Bee Gees song that the Bee Gees actually never recorded that they gave to Graham. But um, I digress. Dark Horse just kind of was 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 really this passionate thing for George. And then when Warner Brothers, see, Warner Brothers dropped all the Dark Horse artists. Harrison didn't drop them it was announced that Warner Brothers was not going to do this anymore and he was signed to Dark or Warner Brothers and he just thought well you know what I'll just put me on Dark Horse and that's fine um but I, I think he'd be happy that Danny's doing what he's doing I mean Danny's really he got Cat Stevens John Lord um or Yusuf Islam sorry John Lord the estate of Joe Strummer Billy Idol um and Leon Russell Leon Russell, which is so good. And, and they did a Nina Simone reissue. And the, that's right. Yeah, it's just uh, um, on Pink Vinyl, too. Um, they're, they're doing some really cool things. And, and Danny's not even on Dark Horse. He's on his own label, yeah. HO2 Records. So I, I, it's interesting. But I think that George really had a belief that the music would speak for itself. 
and um, it would it would find an audience. And I think down the road it has. I, I you know, for me, some of the the greatest things I get is an email from someone in uh, somewhere in Idaho or something that said, "I never heard of Split until I read your book. I've gone to Spotify. Wow, they were great." Okay. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> you discovered Splinter. Yes, and yeah, they were great. They, 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 those three albums are fantastic. You know, can I, can I tell my funny story about the second album? Yeah, I don't know if I put it about Chris Bedding. Chris Bedding put a guitar on it. And he was also working with Paul and Ringo, and he turns up to George's house to work on the Splinter album. George goes, "I don't have any time booked with you today, Chris. I don't know why you're here." He goes, "Yeah, yeah, George, you're supposed to do this." He goes, "Oh no, you're supposed to be at Ringo's house." <laughs> he called Ringo and Ringo said, You want to get here, Chris? <laughs> I like that story. Anyways. You mentioned actually, my next question was going to go towards Ringo Records because we spoke when we met at the Fest for Beatles fans. Um, and I hadn't seen your book yet at that time. And I think I brought up Ringo Records, and then it all kind of pieces started to fall into place. You made me aware of the fact that Ringo Records was launched at roughly the same time as Dark Horse Records. So hey, Ringo and George thinking maybe we should buy Apple. And when that doesn't happen, they both go off and start their own labels. Um, I didn't realize Ringo Records had as many releases on it. Hmm. Um, I think I was aware years ago that there were other things Dark Horse did but not Ringo Records, so that, you know, the label was pretty obscure to me, and you kind of, like, opened my eyes, oh, no, they had this, and it did that, and now you, now, and you mentioned, and Ringo Records is in here, and did you reveal that your next book, are you, are you doing a book on Ringo Records? I'm doing a book on Ringo in the 70s. Okay. So I'm looking at Ringo's career starting in 19, January 1st, 1970, right up to December 31st, 79. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm focusing on the music, his films, his Ringo or Robin Limited, um, his, you know, the furniture design and Ringo Records has got right. three chapters. And the thing about Ringo Records, which was interesting, was it was an album by a guy named Rab Noakes, who is a very famous Scottish folk singer and at the time. And on the album, you got like Jerry Rafferty and <laughs> it's a great album. It's like, this is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, and then you have things like a group called Stormer, which is like this British glam heavy metal band. But Graham Bonnet from Rainbow went solo, and, and he did this album on Ringo Records, which absolutely tanked everywhere, except Australia, where it went top 10 in the single, uh, Warm Ride, made number one. So it's an interesting label. And the, I, I've, I've been fortunate, I've been interviewing artists on the label, and the stories are great, but just how <laughs> Ringo signed them and the and the business meeting, you know, you, you know, well, we just met at a pub and Ringo listened to a cassette. Well, yeah, that's good. I'll give you 300 pounds for it. So <laughs> very, very, very uh, laid back label. But it was distributed uh, in UK and Europe by Polydor, in Canada and America by Capital EMI. But Capital shut it down after one album and two singles. One was David Henschel and then Bobby right. Keys. Bobby Keys released a single. Uh, on, on Ringo Records through Capital in North America. And, and it was actually, believe it or not, um, a seven inch remix single, like a disco version. And it just didn't get played in the clubs, unfortunately. Uh, I had to laugh. I just read Bobby Keys' autobiography. He doesn't even mention it. <laughs> you know, I, um, I, that explains actually why to me, Ringo Records was was practically non-existent. Because nothing was coming out in the United States. Nothing, except for the David Henschel album. That was it. Right. Yeah. And I think it was after we spoke at the fest back in February that I then went home and dig digging around on, I always use eBay sometimes as a research tool where I could look at liner notes. I could check out label designs for first pressings and whatnot. And I, the uh, the folk singer you just mentioned, um, Rab Noakes, Rab Noakes. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I, I'm not sure I'd even heard of him. Um, and I discovered it after we spoke, then going on eBay and going, wow, look at all the people on this. Uh, I like to think I know my stuff. Uh, well, this one slipped past me. A few things have slipped past me. 
but you know what? It, it slipped. It's Jared. It slipped by a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just tell one thing about Ringo? You then. Um, one thing you might find interesting is that um, a couple of the artists that were signed actually wrote songs for Ringo, like yeah. Johnny Warman, who wrote "Don't Go Where the Road Don't." Oh, Go. okay. Um, and "Everyone Wins" was also written by him. And I'm trying to remember the name. Pearl Grossman wrote. Do. What's Pearl, that? Pearl Grossman wrote "Dose yes. of Rock and Roll." Dose of Rock and Roll, yeah. And uh, yeah, Johnny Warman actually in Canada had a massive hit with Peter Gabriel called Screaming Jets, which was, yeah, check it out on YouTube, guys. It's a great song. But he kind of kickstarted the career of some of these, like Johnny Warman and uh, Carl Grossman. But uh, yeah, he wrote a, shot, a dose of rock and roll. Hmm. That's why I do this show, Aaron. I learned so much. <laughs> and um, I, I have my poor wife going, I really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's another... I start these conversations at dinner, but I get my my kids are like there too, going. Right. You didn't go. You didn't go to CVS though today, Dad. Like you promised. <laughs> You're on eBay researching Ringo records. When I, um, when I was writing the Dark Horse book, I'd say to my wife, "Did you know that in '76, Bobo?" She like, "Wow." <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. I can relate. So we've talked a lot about Splinter, a little bit about Jiva. Um, Jiva was a was a was a California band, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I always saw the name and thought I could see them ending up on George Harrison's label, uh, <laughs> just 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 for the name alone. Yeah. Um, uh, and we've mentioned a few others. One thing uh, that's uh, about Dark Horse that con contrasts Apple is that the roster was small and manageable in a way because yeah. there weren't a lot of acts. George didn't just plaster on acts and stuff like that, which might have been the, the result of having basically to having to do a lot of the work himself with a very small, I guess, uh, group of assistants. But uh, let's talk briefly about Attitudes because Attitudes, uh, like you said earlier on, was like an all-star uh, gathering of session players we've seen bands like this through the years stuff comes to mind um the band yeah. stuff attitudes david foster at that time was sort of a, a, a i think a name behind the scenes a little more than way more than today but he was still a player in the industry and you have jim keltner i, I think i think it's easy to forget that keltner what what it wasn't just a session player he did he was in bands. Um, and also Danny Korchmar. Um, so did Attitudes come together uh, after Dark Horse had started? Because that also sounded like these guys were hanging out at a George Harrison session and the band gravitated together from that. Or tell me a little bit about Attitudes' they, origins. They had they were hanging out with Jim Keldner in a bar in LA and he called it the Jim Keldner Elephant Fan Club because of the back of the, the Material World album. And it was just a, a jam that people would just get together and they would jam. And all of the four of them, David Foster, Paul Stallworth, uh, Jim Keldner, and Dave, and uh, Danny Kuchmar, they just kind of gelled and they started jamming and writing their own songs. And, um, the, you know, they were kind of like, I, 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 the Steely Dan of Dark Horse, if you'd like, they were technically fantastic musicians and uh, david foster had a hit um wild flower wild flower you know that was in the early 70s. yeah Skylark. right from vancouver yep. and um you know he writes in his own book that he goes you know we we were difficult to deal with with george like george wanted us to do gigs and interviews and we were like no we're not doing that george it, so that was by his own admission but um yeah the, the attitudes came together as bands uh, members who were just jamming they started recording it and Harrison was a bit annoyed because Keltner didn't go to him and say, we got this group. Harrison heard about it in a roundabout way and said, why wouldn't you come to me? And he goes, well, I didn't want to exploit our friendship. And George is like, oh, for goodness sakes. So, um, you know, it, it, it came out through Dark Horse. And as I said, the second, well, the single Sweet Summer Music here in Canada, it was actually on the Chum charts, which Chum was the biggest AM station until oh, 1986 or 87. And it got played. It was becoming a hit. And then just, you know, 
that plug just got pulled because of the um, A&M stuff, which was a real shame because it could have been a hit. It could have been a contender. But, um, you know, it, it uh, that's that's the attitudes. And they did the second album, Ringo Starr, of course, drums on it with Jim. And uh, there was very limited promotion for the second album. There were Frisbees that you got when you went the album in the record stores. And there was posters. I have the Good News poster. Good News, something from the attitudes. Um, but it was it was not heavily promoted. And then they tried to revive Sweet Summer Music a year after it was minor hit, and it just tanked. It didn't, it, you know, you guys are radio guys. You know, that after a year, the song is kind of the, the bloom, what's the expression? The, the bloom is off the rose, right? So, but uh yeah, that's the attitude. And it's funny because when we talk about Dark Horse, we forget that there was two hits on Dark Horse besides Harrison's music. There was also the stair steps from us to you made top 10 on their R&B charts, which was a big success for that band and was hugely played and is still sampled in, in, in records to this day. And, um, you know, so those two L.A. bands kind of didn't get the attention they perhaps should to this day. But uh, although Attitudes is the only band that that, tour, that Olivia commissioned the greatest hits, it was only streaming on Spotify and yeah. iTunes. But there was an album called um, just Attitudes. I don't know if it was called Good News or what they called it, but it was a compilation of the two albums, and uh, it was good. It should have, again, shame, uh, sadly, it didn't get the attention it deserved. But it was nice to hear it digitally remastered. And you mentioned Stair Steps, who were the band formerly known as the Five Stair Steps, and one of the great pop hits of it was seventy. It came out right, and not sixty nine. Was sixty nine or seventy? And that was a single that I had when I was when I, uh, I was five in 1970. Ooh, child. Um, and they had broken up or they morphed. It was a family band, right? They kind of did this a lot. And then they became Stair Steps. How did they end up uh, on Dark Horse? That was through Billy Preston. Because Harris, because Billy Preston was actually supposed to sign to Dark Horse, but A&M wouldn't let him out of his deal. So Billy said, well, you know what? I have a band. Time out before yeah. you go any further. He was on A and M, right? But A and M, he was signed to A and M, and because the A and M saw Dark Horse as a separate entity. Oh, right. Okay. They were they were like, you can't go to A and M. You're on our label, and he was having massive hits then, right? Yeah. Like, you know, so he introduced Harrison to the Stair Steps and said, you know, you got, and he produced the album, and um, co-produced it with Kenny Burke, and. Um, so everything on Dark Horse came to George through friends. Jeeva came through Olivia. Stair Steps through, um, through Billy Preston. Paul McCartney through a or um, Henry McCulloch through a mutual dislike of Paul McCartney. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I kid, I kid. But they all came to Harrison through friends and people he trusted. And Billy was really pushing that the Stair Steps had gotten back together. This is a major reunion. The album's going to be called Second Resurrection. And when you talk to Alvin Taylor, he he said the sessions were amazing. Harrison came in but didn't control anything. He said, just do what you're doing. And and um it was it was a beautiful album. It really is. It's it, and it just recently got reissued on Record Store Day, right? On gold vinyl. Uh, which is, you know, always nice to have another color version of an album you already owned four times. Yeah. You know, but anyways, um it was it was an interesting album. And as I said, from us to you became a massive hit massive uh, not on the pop charts but certainly on the r&b charts number 10 is, is that was our highest charting single on the r&b charts believe it or not really so, yeah even higher than uchild uchild did better on the pop charts than they did on the r&b charts don't ask me why but and of course their, their lovely cover of dear prudence which is really great yeah the b-side the yeah. Yeah. yeah great so song. <laughs> So they lasted one album on Dark Horse, and they broke up then. And Kenny, Kenny and Burke, Kenny Burke stayed on board as a solo artist and did one record, which I have to this day. That's one album that has slipped past me, and and I should have listened to it in advance of this show. And it's one that's on my radar. And I, you know, you have a lot of stuff, and you have a big collection. When you say, "I think I have it." <laughs> But you're not sure what pile and what room it might be in. 
Um, but Kenny Burke did, and I know it was an album that was got pretty good reviews. I vaguely actually remember when it was in stores uh, when I was a kid. Um, tell us about Kenny Burke then launching a solo career on Dark Horse, and he would go off, as some of these acts, which I'll ask you next, went off a little bit and trickled over to other labels. But Kenny Burke then, I guess, picked up where Stair Steps left off, for well, lack Stair of a better Steps, way of putting it. Stair Steps imploded again. They're, they 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 just, they were brothers. And, you know, they, they, they wanted to tour, they couldn't tour. And all of them had different, all of them had lives that weren't involving music in all of America. So they said, look, we can't afford to stay in LA anymore. If we're not going to tour, the album's out we're done. And so it's interesting when you read the press release um, from Warner Brothers saying, Dark Horse is now in Warner Brothers. We're bringing George Harrison, Splinter, Attitudes, and Stair Steps. But it wasn't Stair Steps, it was just Kenny Burke. And Kenny Burke's album was the only Dark Horse album not to be released in Europe, in England. It, Warner Brothers simply passed on it, said, there's no way we're releasing this over here. And I think that was devastating to Kenny Burke. He 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 put a lot of work into that album. And again, speaking with the drummer, Alvin, T Alvin Taylor, who worked on the album, you know, Kenny was, when you listen to that album, it's like, oh, wow, Prince listened to this album. I guarantee you Prince listened to this album. So it was kind of an influential album when it came out. And I remember it in stores too, you know, Darren, like it, it, it may not have been the biggest album of the year, but I remember seeing the cover and, um, you know, well, I bought it, but I mean, it, it, it was also front racked and it was getting some attention. The two singles didn't do so well. Um, you know, you did an instrumental it from us to you, called it from me to you. And it was a bit bizarre because it was like, well, no need to do that. But he went on, the rest of the band formed other bands, uh, Stair Steps, and they had some minor hits with under other, other names. Um, to answer your kind of go forward, Kenny signed to RCA Records after he was on Dark Horse. Jeeva signed to Polydor. Um, Shankar, of course, went on to a huge career with various labels. Um, Henry McCulloch did not sign to a major label after Dark Horse. Um, and Attitude split up. And, of course, mm -hmm. each had their own careers. So they, they, I think Dark Horse launched the career of many people in, 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 a, in a weird way. No, Splinter. Splinter signed to Columbia Records and were big, big, big in Japan. In fact, did extremely well in the Japanese version of the Eurovision. Um, it's called the Sony International Music Festival. And they finished in the top five. So they did well. They had a big career in Japan. Interesting. And and they just, uh, an album of, of Splinters was just released um, a year or two ago. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, some some archival recordings. Tell us a little bit about that uh, that album. So there's a guy named Nigel Pierce who has written a book on Apple Records called Inside Number Three, I think it's called. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have I that. I know where it is. <laughs> he had, you know, he had in his possession these tapes and he went to this record label that's, um, and the name just went right out of my head. But they negotiated a deal with the two members of Splinter at the time. One member has since passed away. Um, but they they wanted to get the stuff out. And I think there was a lot of hope. There was a, a website put up, Splinter Legacy. I think if they could have released, if they had released it after the Dark Horse reissues, they would have done better. Because, you know, Splinter's first album is back out again on vinyl. You could have bought it on Record Store Day. But, um, yeah, it was just it was just these tapes that were you know live music splinter were remarkably generous and there's a gentleman who took photos in the book of george in paris jean and jean met splinter and he has all he has splinter gave him everything demo tapes the the, the album that he recorded just for george on the acoustic guitar so they did a lot of stuff like that and they had this live material and this company said well let's put it out and they did and it didn't do i reviewed it actually for spill magazine because i write for them and of course, trying to raise the splinter flag, mm. but it just didn't. It just didn't capture the. You know, it's kind of like those two new albums that come out, Tom Evans and Pete Ham. Yeah. They're great albums. They're fantastic albums, but unfortunately, they're not getting the attention they deserve either. But um, so that's what they, that had nothing to do with Dark Horse. 
on a side note, I just finally found, I bought a Splinter BBC live recording uh, from their In Concert series, and it's fantastic. It's it's um, One side is them, the other side is another artist, and I, it's, it's wonderful to hear it, because it's 70, it was recorded in 74, and they're talking about the new Dark or their new Dark Horse album, and it's 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 interesting to listen to. So that hasn't come out actually yet, but I have. Yeah. Uh, my last question just has to do with our, the move to Warner Brothers we touched on earlier in '76. Yeah. Initially, the other artists on Dark Horse you mentioned some of them were going to uh, come over to Warner Brothers, but Warner's no, they did. pulled the plug on everything. Did. Did anything come out of Warner Brothers of another artist? I know that they they there was, but I don't recall what what records did come out on Warner's. Splinter's two man band, um, right? Uh, Attitudes, good news, and Kenny Burke. Okay. okay. Were, and, and so so some stuff did, but eventually Dark Horse was George Harris, um, yeah. as as we pointed out. What was left, literally, of the label? Was it just a logo? At the uh, towards the end by the eighties, or was there still a staff of one <laughs> or two, or, or what? What existed in those final years when it was just the label that George's records were coming out on? I'll I'll answer that question by giving you an example. If you bought the single all those years ago in Italy or Ireland, it was on Warner Brothers. Okay, and it would say you know Dark Horse Records on the bottom, very small print. It was just really uh, uh, an office of one. There's a joke that was told by, um, you mentioned Neil Innes, which by the way, I'm thrilled to read that book, but Neil Innes said that Dark Horse shared its office with Handmade Films for a short time and eventually Handmade Films took over the office and Dark Horse had a desk. So that was kind of what happened. That that Harrison was then focusing on Handmade Films and Dark Horse kind of got lost in the shuffle. And, and for me, the big tragedy is those soundtracks should have been on Dark Horse Records. I, I To this day, I'm going to keep waving that flag until people say, stop it. But, you know, there's some great soundtracks that should have been on. I just bought the soundtrack to Time Bandits last year. It's not on Dark Horse. It's on some other small label. And, mm -hmm. you know, Water is on a very obscure small label distributed through London Records. Water, with, which has a song with Harrison and Ringo on it. Right. Uh, you know, Freedom. And it just... It just kind of, I don't understand. It should have all been on Dark Horse. And Harrison said that that was the hope that that um, there would be the soundtrack. And I remember sitting through, and I sat through it in the theater, Shanghai Surprise. And at the very end, it said soundtrack on Dark Horse Records. And you, I literally yelped. Yes! You know? uh -huh. Yay! <laughs> so then, of course, it didn't come to be. But that's another story. Yeah, that recording of Freedom, which is a reggae tune. Yeah. They're in the band together, George and Ringo, with Eric Clapton. Yeah. Billy Connolly, I think. Was on and there. it's it's kind of gotten lost over the years. Yeah. And it's a great, at first of all, it's a great track. But, oh, my gosh. It just, and I think Ray, Coop, Ray Cooper's in there, too. I mean, it's yeah. a, I think so, if I'm percussion right. But it was a great song. And, and it just got on the soundtrack album that no one bought and or cared about. Great right. movie, Water. Quite like it. But um, in conclusion, something that was mentioned earlier on in the interview was how being on Apple ultimately was probably a bad business move for a lot of artists. And same with Dark Horse. And the perception was, oh, you you got your deal, or you're here because you're on George's label, you're on Apple, possibly. A reason why other artists' labels that were launched in the late 60s and 70s never tended to have the rosters that Apple did, the Dark Horse did. Moody Blues Threshold Records, they had one or two other acts. Tra I think one band was, was a Trapeze, if I'm not mistaken, was on Threshold Records. They were mainly the Moody Blues. The Rolling Stones label, Rolling Stones Records, it had Peter Tosh. I don't know of anyone else that recorded on other than solo Keith Richards. Um, uh, and I had an, oh, even Elton John's label, the Rocket Record Company, who was, I think, more of a presence in the UK. Here, it was just a cool looking label and then gone in a couple of years. 
Uh, when we, had, we had Neil Sedaka. Yeah. Sedaka was on it. The Hudson Brothers, I think. That actually would be, I guess, you know, but still quickly gone. Um, and you, But when you think of Apple, you know that there's this whole other um, part of the story, not just the Beatles and, and Dark Horse Records, too. Maybe it was just the nature of the beast. Artist labels don't can't cut it when it comes to other artists. If you know what I'm s trying to say here. I see a little head behind you. Oh, that's my cat. The priest did pretty well. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. The priest did pretty well. That was Frank Sinatra's label. Yeah, but what, and uh, and I again knew this. Should know more. Sinatra was on Reprise, but Reprise was Sinatra wasn't that involved. How involved was he with the day in day out operation of the label? It seemed like the label was able to exist as a label itself. Can you um, imagine him signing Hendrix? I know. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Frank Zappa. Yeah. Hey, Frank. But, <laughs> So um, anyway, uh, 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 Alan, Ken, uh, please. I just wanted in. to comment since Aaron said that Dark Horse helped to launch the careers of, of some of their artists there. Look at Apple. <laughs> I mean, James Taylor, a, an artist that nobody even talks about. Hot Chocolate started yeah. on Apple. You know, um, Billy, Billy Preston. Preston. Yeah. Although Billy Preston was on Capitol before he was on Apple. But, you know. They had so much more success after Apple. Yeah. And just makes you wonder. It's it's baffling when you listen to a lot of those artists like Jackie Lomax and certainly the James Taylor album. Why didn't those records do better? Right. So James uh, Jackie Lomax even ended up back at Capitol. Yeah. After one or two records, I think he was with Warner Brothers at least for one. Yep. And then he ends up back at Capitol when all was said and done. Um, but yeah, I've always found that interesting that Apple, a couple, you know, a couple artists did very well. Dark Horse, generally speaking, it was all sort of fringe success. And some of these artists then will go elsewhere and enjoy, you know, what's coming to them, mainly the Apple people. But um no, Apple, Apple was an amazing label. That's why I started my book off by saying Apple was not a failure. Apple was a success. Whether, whether how do you how do you define success? But I mean, the, the artists that Apple had were, you know, and I the only reason I didn't write a book on Apple is because it's been covered brilliantly by other people. So I thought I can't add anything. But Dark Horse is that kind of you know, it's a <laughs> as someone once said to me, well, Dark Horse was kind of a Dark Horse label, and it was. So I just really wanted to kind of expose a little bit about it. So, and I, I I fully expect other people to write later on and dig up more information because it's it's it really is interesting. And and there's stuff that I've discovered since I wrote my book. That I thought, oh, I wish I'd known that when I wrote this book, so I could have thrown that in, you know. But you know, you got to stop sometime, right? You can do. I a wanted to just. I just wanted to mention um, since since you uh, brought up the. The recent releases of Pete Ham and Tom Evans. Um, I had Tom Brennan on my. Tom's music, great, and he Big did a lot of work, helped you out with your book, and I've been giving away. This is the Pete Ham CD, yeah. Quiet Gardens. This is the Tom Evans one. I am myself, so you can still win this on my website, by the way, <laughs> with my Beatles trivia. Tom, Tom, is, Tom is a huge help, but Tom, Tom and I had a lot of um, these kinds of calls, Zoom calls, and um, Tom is a wealth of knowledge, and, um, you know, I kept saying to him, you should get a co-write on this with me, and he goes, I don't want to write, I don't want to write, I'll just give you some information, okay, but he he was amazing, and he's a great guy, and I wish him, I, I look forward to working with him again in the future, but he really knows, like, he knows Ringo Records, too, so I can, I'll be knocking on his door, you know, Mm. Visual, virtually <laughs> great guy always need someone like that in your corner when you're writing oh, your books. yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. one of the things that that struck me as kind of interesting about this is that um the problems between dark horse and a and m are first mentioned on or at least that i first noted on page 58 which is really early in the book um 
and you know it it follows through with Warner as well. I mean, it's it's kind of strange that like you know we 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 talked a little about this about how they were they really felt that they were signing George, and I'm sure that Warner really felt that they were signing George, and everyone just sort of signed on Dark Horse because he's as if they're humoring him, you know. Um, but because of that, I mean, I, I always, you know, not, not being a specialist in dark horse, um, I've, I, you know, I had the, 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 the splinter and attitudes and stair steps and Kenny Burke records and, and Ravi. Um, and in fact, actually, I remember getting, um, Shankar family and friends as a promo when it, when, when the first batch was launched, um, and thought it was really interesting. But by the time you went to Warner, I was sort of like not really focusing on Dark Horse as a going concern anymore. And so it in a way surprised me reading the book that Warner had taken some of those, those groups, you know, and put out uh, a, a few releases. But I had always thought, in a way I'd thought of George uh, after EMI as being basically a Warner artist, even though all of his records had, you know, this dark horse label, you know, that, uh, you know, take it out of the sleeve. There it is. It's dark horse. But for some reason that I just sort of always spaced out on the dark horseness of it. And it was sort of like, it was just a vanity imprint, you know? Um, but it, it, it's, it's it's really kind of interesting because in a way by going to Warner he ended up really losing Dark Horse as a label you know A&M they may have had issues about whether they wanted to promote tours and how much they wanted to put into promotion but it it seems to me in retrospect that they were more into it than Warner was the, the, absolutely there's no question I mean if, if, I mean Although that the advertisement from Warner Brothers when Harrison signed was great. It was Bugs Bunny riding the Dark Horse logo, saying Dark Horse is now on Warner Brothers, which is great, or now with Warner Brothers. But the, you know, you're 100% right. But the one thing that George did that was really smart was that because he took Dark Horse to Warner, Warner Brothers, he kept the ownership, which is why when the contract ended, the agreement with Warner Brothers ended after the Double Live Japan album. The albums disappeared for a short time, and then they came back out on Universal, and now they're on BMG. Like he, he, and some of them came out on EMI in the early '90s. He was smart that he he actually owned them, even though he was signed to Warner Brothers. They never owned them. The, he was signed to them, but the, he kept it the because otherwise they'd still be on Warner Brothers, and they're not. They're they're he took them. He well, Olivia kept moving them from label to label, and um, and that was Loka. LOKA, that was his product, really the the umbrella company. And um, but to your point, a hundred percent, when he signed to Warner Brothers, he lost the label. And it just became George Harrison solo. And once the Warner Brothers contract ended, the first thing he did was he did the box set with Ravi celebration, which was the first time any Dark Horse songs other than George's were on CD and came back out again. And and they were they were. It was a nice to have that package. And that was to, if you look at the box set, it was Dark Horse Guardian Records, right? So, yeah, he lost it. And I don't know, I think he was tired by 77 too. I mean, certainly when he was interviewed about the George Harrison album, he was kind of, I'm done. That's, I, I tried, didn't work. I'm going to focus on my solo career. And even, even then, after, um, you know, so the George Harrison, then he did Summer in England, and then there was a big break then got trouble big break and then you know it's just kind of or no it was gone trouble then somewhere in england it was just um i think he was he was disappointed with and it certainly once water brothers rejected somewhere in england I was which was the that, biggest, yeah. biggest slap in the face any beetle i mean that was the first well maybe i guess they've stopped smell the roses but that was different that was because the, the label collapsed and he went to another label but that was a big slap in the face to Harrison, right? To take off four songs and rework it and, and um, change the cover art. And I'm not surprised he didn't do any promotion for that album. I'm sure he thought, you know, I'm not doing anything. But it was a big album, Summer in England. But um, 
great album too. I stand by that statement. Would you? I, I always know? love the fact that the, that part of his response to that rejection was to record "Blood from a Clone." Oh, oh. <laughs> that's that's it's really sort of telling them, you know. <laughs> um, Can I just ask? Did Warner Brothers reject specifically those four songs? Yes, they felt that they they felt that those songs there, there were too many slow songs, too many depressing songs. And they wanted him to do upbeat songs, which is why, you know, in Blood from a Clone, it's very upbeat and it's very danceable, but it's also very scathing. But um, yeah, they, those songs were identified by Warner Brothers as not commercially viable. What are we doing with this? And they hated the cover. They hated the original cover art. They felt it was just too dark, too bleak. Which I don't agree, but I mean, whatever. But um, yeah, they they just sing. They just said no. We're not putting those songs out. So well. The song "Flying Hour" <laughs> of the four of them. I mean, that's a very commercial song. I could I, have seen that as a single. I I, I thought that was crazy. <laughs> well, record executives, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, "Teardrop" should have been a huge hit, but yet it tanked after all those years ago. Mm. I don't know. I, I you're right. That's I was crazy. like, "Flying Hour," What's because that? you know. Warner before that had been really sort of in the running to get Paul as well. And they spent a lot of the early 70s, you know, underwriting Denny Lane's solo record, uh, taking on uh, McGear. And a lot of these were perceived at the time as being an effort to ingratiate themselves to Paul so that when Paul was, Paul's contract with EMI was over, that Warner would be in the running. So they're hankering after two Beatles we know of. They get one and then reject an album of his. It's 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 really kind of astonishing in a way, you know? I mean, this is this is what they wanted. They wanted a Beatle on their label. And uh, you know, to 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 then say, well, you know, we don't we don't like these four really good songs <laughs> on your record. It's 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 uh, it's mind-boggling. Like you say, record executives, what can you do? <laughs> I I still think I still think the, the the Zappa clip where he talked about record executives in the '60s were better than the hip young guys in the '70s because he said, you know, they just didn't care. Ah, we'll put it out. Who cares? <laughs> but they they started doing the whole target marketing, and I I you know what? I'd love to have been in those meetings and hear what they said, but. Uh, it, it 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 baffles me to this day because Flying Hour, one song for sure, could have been a hit song. But and who knows? If they hadn't done it, maybe Harrison would have promoted it. Maybe he would have done some videos. Maybe he would have, you know. But he by the time it came out, he was a bit bitter, and I don't blame him. Like mm -hmm. I, I really don't. And it it was met with indifference by the record company. Um, certainly, God Trapo was. But you know, then they played the game with Cloud Nine, and look what happened, right? Monster album. So. Yeah, it was much more contemporary sounding for its well, Lynn, yeah. moment with with Jeff Lynn producing. Yep. Did did, uh, did George carry any grudges after uh, Warner Brothers dropped all the other acts on Dark Horse? Was he angry about that, or by this time was George starting to, like you said, he was tiring of the whole industry machine? He did an interview in '79 to promote George Harrison, and he said. It got to be a drag running the label. So was he being bitter? I don't know. He he really was quite happy to see it shut down, he said in the interview. But what he really thought, I don't know. I think he felt like he, if you look at what he did for the, the last Splinter album, Parker McGee wrote two songs. He brought in a huge producer who produced Kenny Rogers, promoting the album. He even, he even offered Don't Let, um, uh, don't let Me Wait Too Long. Yeah. So look, I when you cover this, this could be a big hit. I'll play slide on it for you. But they turned him down. And um, so he was trying still. And that was 77. So once that fizzled out and Waters dropped all the artists, he I think he gave it up, you know. Wasn't that for the second album? No, it was for the for third album. Harder to Live. Harder to Live was still on AM. Okay. Um, Harder to Live had that weird history where they were supposed to record that in LA. And they couldn't get to L.A. And there's three different excuses given. I don't know which one is the actual truth. So that's why Harrison recorded Extra Texture in L.A. because he had paid for the studio time at A&M Records. 
and he needed to use the studio time or, or lose the money. It was one of his only albums not recorded in England. I think it's the only one, really, because it was recorded entirely in L.A., uh, other than you. And, um, and they recorded at his place while he was recording Extra Texture. And um, that's where Chris Spedding was kind of <laughs> jumbling, <laughs> getting confused as to where he was supposed to be. But um, that was Tom Scott put that band together, and he was using a lot of uh, Maria Mulder's music, musicians who were playing in London at the time. Right. So it was it was no hard to live was a second album and on a and m third album was warner brothers two-man band <laughs> which by the way Hunter really hated the cover just say it and they, they, both of them are very clear with me uh, worst cover ever and i'm thinking i wish worst comic book guy like he should be saying that line <laughs> from the simpsons but anyways so tell us about the decision to sort of revive dark horse in recent years and do the reissues and and take on some new stuff and uh like like how did um how and why did danny decide to do that well i think danny realized that there was um there was a lot of attention being paid you know harrison has kind of become a very popular beetle in the last 10 years and a lot of his solo stuff was starting to be picked up Certainly, you know, you look at Guardians of the Galaxy, they used My Sweet Lord, and all of a sudden, Harrison became quite big, bigger than he ever had. I'm going to argue that, that you know, he's really attracted a huge fan base. And he, they had control of the music. And I think he went through Olivia and said, look, this is just sitting here. George had said, when he put out the Shankar album, Harrison said at the time, I'm planning on going back to all the old Dark Horse days. He did a, a Rockline interview. And on the, no, I'm sorry. He was doing an uh, AOL interview when All Things Must Pass, the reissue came out just before he passed. Yeah. And he said, I want to do the old Dark Horse albums again and bring them back out and, and see if anyone likes them. And I think Danny kind of picked up from that and said, you know, dad wanted us out. And I, and I think George did. And I think his manager said, well, if you're going to revive a label, you got to be current. So let's sign some people. Now, you could argue that the people he's signing aren't exactly the most current, but you know, it's a it's it's a niche label. They're issuing some fine music. I hear Billy Idol's music on radio all the time. So, and Joe Strummer certainly has done extremely well for Dark Horse. The the albums have charted in the UK. They've done well. They you know. So I think it was all those things. And its manager kind of saying, "Well, why don't we go for it? You know, let's do it up. Let's do it." And they. I think they've been successful thus far, so far. So we'll see what happens around the corner. <laughs> I mean, it'd be interesting to see what the next reissue is, because the All Things Must Pass, huge box set. Mm. Um, I'm I'm hoping it's Material World. I'd love to, I my my dream is to see Dark Horse album with maybe a concert film, some live music, <laughs> unreleased B sides and demos, and that's just with my, with a with a music. price with a price tag that is manageable and saves marriages yes exactly 100 percent. yes no well, the name dark horse what came first the label name on uh, george used it for his album or did he have that name in mind for an album and let me call my label this also no he had the label name first and when he did the album he thought well you know this will kind of be a way to promote the dark horse record label even though it's on apple because he wanted to call it was very smart. He, he wanted to call the tour with him and Shankar like a Dark Horse tour because he's promoting the album Dark Horse and Shankar's on Dark Horse. And he played Splinter between acts. Um, so it was kind of a clever way to kind of get the name out there. And he was doing a lot of press. And he talked about the label. He talked about Dark Horse, but definitely the label first. And then the album came, the album title. So, mm -hmm. so why did you um, decide to do Ringo for your next book instead of, say, um, Handmade Films? Well, there's an excellent book about Handmade Films already. That again, I thought this was kind of a definitive book about Handmade Films. And the author's name just went out of my head, but it's a really good book. Um, I'll tell you the truth. I'm doing two books at the same time. I'm working on Ringo, and I'm also working on a book of a Canadian band called Clatu, who <laughs> yeah. people thought were the Beatles for a brief time. Beatles adjacent, one might say. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you talk about 
a rumor that just killed a band and it just destroyed them. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting story because, I mean, people didn't think they were influenced by the Beatles. People thought they were the Beatles. But I wanted to do Ringo for the same reason. You know, when I read Ringo books, people talk, they'll talk about Ringo, Good Night Vienna, but then they don't go into the whole detail about Roto Gravier, Ringo the Fourth, Bad Boy, his TV special, his movies. Um, I, I, I was very fortunate just to interview Ray Connolly. We talked about That'll Be the Day and Ringo's contributions to that film, you know, to the point of costumes where Ringo was saying, no, nah, no, nah, they didn't wear that back in 60. You know, this is what they wore. And he, he was showing Ray Connolly clothes that he had kept from mm. his youth. And this is what people wore. Um, so it's an interesting period for Ringo because he was remarkably busy that decade. I mean, he was busy with, with you know, B.B. King and Howlin' Wolf and Harry Nelson. And, you know, so I just thought, well, and... Like, let's be honest, I couldn't do a whole book on Ringo records <laughs> as much as I'd like to. I don't know that it would be much more than 50 pages, but, um, you know, it's an interesting topic. And I find Ringo, you know, this is just me. I find him underrated. I, I think sometimes people kind of gloss over, but I, I, I'm going to stand by and say that those albums in the 70s, and to this day, I think he does great albums, great music. And uh, I just, I just think that it'd be a nice way to kind of sum up his career in in a book you know but but not just focus on the Ringo and Goodnight Vienna album but but all I mean just doing the research and talking to people it's really interesting to see what he was doing um you know in the early 70s and the later 70s it's just really fascinating I'm happy to hear you say that because yeah. I think um when people reassess Ringo's solo career and certainly on the podcast shows that I've done here and on Talk More Talk, I always say that when he when he released Time Takes Time Takes Time, it was really um, you know the start of a, a whole new era in Ringo's career where yep. he really focused on the quality of his albums. But in turn, a lot of people then look at the late seventies of Ringo and look at that as his weakest period. But there's a lot of really good stuff that came out of the late 70s. And one of the things that I appreciate most about that time period is that Ringo started songwriting a lot yes. more. Not just the songs he wrote with George Harrison, but with Vinnie Poncia. So I find that really interesting, um, especially the album that everybody trashes, Ringo the Fourth. You know, um, he has six songs on there that he wrote with, with uh, Vinnie Poncia. And I like most of them. You know, and, and and just a dream on the B side, yeah, which is a great a lost B side, man. That's a great song, definitely. So, and, uh, and to your I point, don't you think he, he must have liked it, Ken, because he did he re record Wings on a recent album? I mean, yes, he did, yeah, yeah. Why not? I think was it or was it on uh, yeah, Ringo 2012? When I think was... Ringo 2012. Um. I don't remember. It's one of the two. He also redid Step Lightly. That's right. right. So, uh, and everyone wins. I, I agree with you. I think the songs on Ringo the Fourth are completely underrated. Uh, there's some fine, it's no secret, great song. I mean, it's, it's, it's I'm with you. So that's my argument too. I, actually, I think Bad Boy has some great stuff on it too. I think Old Timer 11, keyboard yep. of that song. Wow, that, that organ. And that was recorded here in Toronto. So, <laughs> Heart on My Sleeve is one of his best songs. That song should have been a hit. Should I, As a teenager, I wrote to Portrait Records about that, you know, and they wrote to me saying, you know, we, we released it and unfortunately it didn't do as well as we had hoped, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. As soon as I heard that's that. cool that you actually wrote to a label like Portrait and got an answer. Yeah, talk yeah. about how the times have changed yeah. in this industry. I tell you something that single didn't get released in Canada, so I wrote to Portrait and they actually sent me a copy because they said we're not releasing it in Canada as a single. But it, you know what? We feel you know here here's a single for you. Yeah, Which I think would be great if Portrait Records is. I have a story like that. I wrote to the Wings Fun Club um, about, I think I was inquiring about 
the song Zoo Gang, uh, which I had, I don't know what, what publication or maybe I knew it existed that Band on the Run had a different B-side and it was a, um, you know, it was out in the UK. And I think I, I think the, I think I basically wrote and I said, I understand that there's a song called Zoo Gang on the flip side of the Band on the Run single. Where can I get it? That's probably was what I was, um, probably what I was writing to them. They sent me a copy, which I thought was very cool. I didn't have to pay for it. Then again, I, who knows what the dues were, but um, they sent me a copy of it, uh, and I still have it today. That was the first time, you know, that was my introduction to Zoo Gang for many years. Was that that seven inch single? I never quite understood, and this is a topic for another show and a topic when we've got Alan on the griddle um, about McCartney post-Apple. Uh, I always thought of Capital as solely a U.S. label, yet here was the Band on the Run single coming out with Zoo Gang on the B-side on Capital in the U.K. And I just, but that's for another show. I, it, it's funny you mentioned that story because I, I don't know if I put it in the book. I talked about it at the at the Beatles at the Fest for Beatles, is that um, I couldn't find the Dark Horse singles for Love Nor Money here in Canada, so I took a bus to Scarborough, which is where A and M Records was located at the time, and I walked in and said, "Listen, I mean, I was 12, 14 maybe, 13, 14. I said I can't find these singles. I just gave me a stack of promo Dark Horse here. Take them. We're not going to do anything with them. What shouldn't you send them to radio stations?" whatever so i got all these canadian promo copies of splinter and jiva and all that stuff it's very funny but anyways that's that's my other little tidbit so uh, you were focused in on and aware of and into the music by the beatles uh, one of the beatles labels as at uh, growing up as a kid yeah well that's... it was a it was i think it was my mother who tried to use reverse psychology because I, when i when i discovered um all together in our book and and uh illustrated a record i said i'm going to get every beetle record ever made and she went well you know that means you got to buy apple and there's this dark horse label so i thought well that's okay challenge accepted and uh <laughs> started collecting as a 12 year 10 or 75 so 11 years old so and i couldn't find the dark horse stuff and i there was one record store in oshawa wilson and lee and they couldn't get it from AM. So I just thought, well, I'm going to go on a bus and see what happens. They, they were very nice to a little kid. And uh, Warner Brothers, not so much. But AM were very nice. Just saying. <laughs> How did you find out information about these new releases as they were happening? Because I always like to cite um, the book altogether now for having all those chapters on the yeah. side projects of the Beatles. And then that led to Chris Engelhardt's books and all that. Yeah. But as they were happening at that time, where would you have even known about it? Well, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I used to listen to BBC World Service. Uh -huh. and they, they, there was announcers that would talk. Of, that was the first time I heard Splinter was on BBC World Service. They played uh, Cost of Fine Town. And they would, they would occasionally, and then I was buying the British magazines. I could get the British magazines, Melody Maker, um, The Enemy, and a record mirror in in Oshawa, and that maybe a month late, but I could get them. And I would I would they would review or they would have advertisements for these Dark Horse records. I remember the advertisement. There was an advertisement for Henry McCulloch. It was like Henry McCulloch and Attitudes, and Jiva, the three albums. And I said Dark Horse records. So I would just make notes. I still have my diaries of of, of seeing these things in newspaper. I didn't know what the Ringo records. Of, full full disclosure. That I've been into in the last few years, but the Dark Horse, I would see in advertisements in Rolling Stone or Cream, and or they would be reviewed. Again, probably the reason I couldn't get them is because I found out about them three months after they had been released. So, you know, um, that was it was just through reading. I was this may this may shock all of you, but I was really a, a nerd and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just read a lot of magazines and stayed home and listened to BBC World Service on my shortwave radio. <laughs> and then there's all the records that are side projects of the Beatles that aren't on these labels. Like mm -hmm. I went nuts in the 70s looking for Fourth of July by John Christie. I just found a copy, Ken. I just found a copy. <laughs> 
So it's like, hi, I would go to the fest for Beatle fans, then Beatle Fest and look for it there. And if it wasn't there, where am I going to get it? Yeah, so, I, I, I literally got a copy three months ago. I'm off Discogs. Finally. Yeah. I've been looking. And some of these songs are gems. I agree. They really are. Listen, go, I, Denny Lane, Holidays, great album. Great yeah. Album. Okay. I just want to ask a, a couple things here. Um, you mentioned something that I found intriguing with the stair steps and that they used this new <clears throat> synthesizer, this, uh, what was it called exactly? Um, I wrote it, Tonto. Tonto. Okay. And that was at the time very inventive. And I think Stevie Wonder used that kind of sound too. And, and Kenny Burke, who we mentioned had the solo album, he was looked at as being you know, a real genius of like Stevie Wonder quality. Can you talk more about that? And because I think towards the end of your book, you do mention that one of the faults of the Dark Horse music is that you kind of find some of that stuff is dated of its time. And the sound of this Tonto synthesizer might be a part of that. You know, I certainly don't think Splinter in any way splinter sounds so much like the soft rock of the 70s that's oh. acoustic kind yeah, of yeah. lobo ish <laughs> if you will you know notice i snuck lobo in there i <laughs> love that aaron <laughs> being canadian this to score some points there <laughs> you need a dog named boo come on, come on. <laughs> you know that 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 all happened because i'm, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong because i'm terrible with names but robert margaloff yeah produced Billy Preston. Billy brought him in on the Stair Steps project and he yeah. invented the Tonto with his partner. His name just gone right out of my head. And uh, he brought the technology to Stair Steps and, and worked with Kenny as well. I actually was so fortunate to interview him and, and uh, he had great stories. And he said, you know, this was cutting edge synth and it really yeah. was. And um I did. I don't disagree with you. It's kind of like again. I'm going to say this and maybe get hurt, but some of early Prince's stuff is dated because of the technology he was using. I like Prince, but I use him as an example because although it was good music and it is, it does have a, a best before date in terms of sound. And mm. and Splinter doesn't. I don't think the Attitudes do. Quite frankly, Henry McCulloch's album could be released today, and it would be on the blues and folk charts, in my opinion. But um, yeah, I think that was the Tonto technology. But you know, it was it was fun and it was great and and it worked at the time and and how can you fault them? It was great, just great. When I listen to Attitudes, I'm thinking maybe I should think more Steely Dan, but I I thought it had more of an average white man feel to it. That's that's actually an absolute brilliant um, comparison. I. I <laughs> I think so too. That's a good one. I, don't, I wish it's where were you when I wrote the book? <laughs> Yacht I Rock the Ringo book then. <laughs> Yacht Rock Radio on Sirius XM should watch the show and add some splinter and attitudes to the rotation. Agreed. I'll write yeah. that. Um, you know that the the Beatles channel on Sirius XM has a it's a I think it's called Dark Horse. It's a George Harrison with the the individual artists on Dark Horse that they showcased. Do you ever get involved with that? Well, funny you should ask. I did talk to Laura Cantrell. And, um, right now, they have to put things through the Harrison estate, and they're exploring the book before they put me on the show. Um, I, I like to think I didn't say anything negative about Harrison. I don't think it's a, I, I stayed away from I didn't want to write a, a book that put him down. I, I think he had the best intention. So I hope they pick that up when they read the book. That it's not, I'm not saying he was a lousy businessman. I'm just saying that he he was maybe a bit out of time with the promotion of it. But so they're aware of it. Um, and where it's going from there, I don't know. But uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. That'd be nice. I'd love to to do something. And I actually I spoke to to um Tom at the fest just recently, and he he was a big fan of the book, he said to me. So I mean, he doesn't have to say that to me because he's famous. I'm not. Yes. <laughs> he's more famous now because of your book. Oh, yes. I don't think so. But. <laughs> <laughs>
Do, do you know, have you ever, well, have you ever spoken to Olivia or Danny ever? I, I've reached out to their management. I've not heard anything back. So, and I, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'm sure they get a lot of requests for this kind of stuff and they, you know, there's, you know, I'm sure they want to be protected and that's fine. I totally understand that. So maybe you never know. I keep, I keep thinking I'm going to hit my email button one day and be, hi, I'm Danny. You may know me from, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would think they'd be flattered that someone would take the, this effort to do all this research on all the artists on on his label. Laura loved it. She 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 actually came up to me. I was in New York, and she came in and she goes, "Hi, and Laura." And I was like, "Oh my gosh!" And she said, "I love your book," and I actually gave it to the Harrisons, and I, I'd love to have you on the show. And you really, you know, she was actually quite complimentary. Um, and again, I don't think I'm putting the label down or anything. I just try to be fair and equitable and try to, you know, I mean, if anything, I've been been criticized for being too nice. Because someone said someone wrote a review on Amazon said he seems to think everything is great. Well, no, I just think that, you know, within context, but you know, I'm not gonna break oh, this is a, a, a bad album because I don't think it is a bad album. It, every, it's a subjective, right? But right. given what was going on at the time, you think, well, this should have found an audience certainly splinter should have found a bigger audience than they did um I, I, you know henry mcculloch i keep going back to him that's such a good album um and i think he was even surprised it didn't sell certainly his manager when i spoke to him dave goodman said you know he couldn't figure it out I, yeah i don't know man so okay um could you just remind everybody and i know that you say it in the book and you brought it up a few times here um what albums are available now physically has have any of them come out on cd or it's just vinyl and digital vinyl and digital nothing other than shankar uh in the box i don't know if that's still in print or not but nothing is on cd but on vinyl you can you can find shankar family and friends uh splinters first album jeeva no jeeva no, no no stair steps um shankar single of i am missing you and of course harrison's catalog is available on vinyl and cd still i think but it's being shifted over to bmg i think what you're buying now is the remaining copies of universal what i was told by bmg and universal is that starting this year 2024 things are going to be shifting to bmg so they're going to become available again i think that's it i don't think there's Everything's on Spotify and iTunes, but right. I think that's the only vinyl that's coming to mind. Of course, I'll end this interview and go, oh, this one. No, but I think that's the, the main ones. Because I'm still a physical person. I don't want to buy vinyl. Yeah. And um, do you know why they've they've bypassed CDs altogether? Or, or I don't understand the whole streaming thing, to be honest with you. Like, like there'll be something put out and it's download only or stream only. I don't understand why people do that because certainly artists that I, John Oates put out a new album is only stream and download. Yeah. John, your fan base is my age and we're, we want the CD or vinyl or both preferably. Um, not multicolored Paul. One color. He's <laughs> <laughs> <Maybe>, sensible. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I, I think they were test again, it's that kind of testing the market to see if people would actually listen to it and, um, I think this, the plays have been pretty good. Splinter's certainly getting a lot of, when I look at the numbers on Spotify, it's been getting some attention. So fingers crossed there'll be more vinyl to come. Danny's promised. He said it's all coming out. Oh, and of, of the new stuff, all of it's been on vinyl. Leon Russell, not John Lord yet, but but uh, Yusuf Islam, uh, Joe Strummer, Billy Idol, it's all been on vinyl CD. Billy Idol, multicolors, of course. Uh, Nina Simone was on vinyl um yeah so that's it and, and leon russell that's that's a lot of albums too right how yeah. many leon russells i know they did one of the hank one of the uh hank wilson albums has come out on vinyl yeah uh i don't remember which volume it is three maybe two. but two. Two. two and there's also the compilation albums signature songs are those the only two from leon russell so far thus far yeah so that's it. But again, I'm waiting to see that see what they do with John Lord, quite frankly. That's it, you know. Not, I, I wasn't even aware he had so many solo records. I wasn't either. 
It was like, oh. wow, <laughs> they're there, they're there. Okay. You know, before we go, right before we started to record this, you had told us that you saw George in concert in 74. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get to, I ran away. Oh. I didn't get to the show um, because my brother took me back home because I was in big trouble. Uh, I had, I had skipped off school. He was playing here in December of 74. I saved up, I had a paper out. I saved all the money to get a bus to Toronto. I actually had money to buy a scalping, scalper's ticket. Going to the afternoon show, I hopped a bus. The school called my mom and said, you know, where's Aaron? He's not here. Um, so we put two and two together. She knew her, because I had said, can I go see George Harrison? She had said, no. So she went, ah, he's run away to Toronto. So there was only one bus that went from Whitby to Toronto. I was on it. I got off the bus. My brother was literally leaning against his car when I got off the bus and said, get in my car and we're going home. And I said, no, but please let me see George. And he said, mom's really mad and I don't want to make her any angrier. So no, we got to go home. And then uh, the, the icing on the cake was she took away every Beatle record I owned, solo and group, single and album for a month. I couldn't listen to the Beatles, couldn't listen to the radio. I was in trouble, but um, I, that close to seeing George. <laughs> but that was my story, my George Harrison story. And I, I, I was so close. And unfortunately, my brother said, no, mom wants you home now. So let's go. And I, you know, I tried to not cry all the way home, but I did because I was so close to seeing Beatle. But And you didn't go to Japan, right? In 91? I tried, couldn't get tickets. This is like, you know, this was pre-internet. So I was doing phone calling and trying to get tickets. Yeah. I tried. I tried. I tried to get tickets for the London show that he did for the Doug Hennings party. And uh, I tried. Oh, well. Okay. So thanks, Aaron, for coming by and telling us all about... Uh, Dark Horse and the writing of the book and all of this detail. And we're looking forward to your Ringo book. Um, do you want to tell us how people can get in touch with you? You have a website. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a website, uh, AaronBadgley.com. I think there's a line between Aaron and Badgley. Aaron Badgley, music author on Facebook. And, uh, you know, you can get in touch with me either way or I write for a magazine called spill magazine you can they they send me all the emails that people write to them about me some of them are actually nice some of them are not because they, they don't agree with my reviews but um that's uh and and the book is available everywhere amazon barnes and noble walmart uh all bookstores if they don't have it in they can order it you can order it online um i'm not selling it directly because postage from canada is insane it's, like it's so much money it, I, I don't want to kind of burden people about extra cost um so no. and it's in, in europe and england it's available waterstones and all the bookstores there too will you be at fest again in march i hope so i've been invited i i love doing those things they're, they're a blast i plan to yes i, I so think people who buy it can bring their copy along and you'll sign it when you yes absolutely as, as the good lord willing of the creeks don't rise i'll be there okay hank williams used to end his radio shows <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we'll go around and give our info and um, start with Ken. Okay. If you want to get in touch with me by email, it's every little thing at att.net. Uh, my other Beatles podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, we just recorded yesterday um, an interview with David Spinoza and Kenny Asher. And David Spinoza was one of my first major interviews going back to the mid 80s when I was on WDHA in New Jersey. And uh, the two of them are both on the Mind Games album. And David and Kenny are, you know, huge studio musicians. Uh, they're on so many albums from the 70s on up, you name it. And um, we had a great conversation talking about the Mind Games album, the new box set. Um, the other work that they did with the Beatles, Kenny, in fact, uh, played on Walls and Bridges and Rock and Roll. David Spinoza was on Ram and, in fact, was even asked to join Wings, which I didn't know. That's what he said to me in the interview, because we do know that um, the <coughs> guitar player Hugh McCracken was asked to be at Wings and he turned it down. Um, and uh, David, in fact, was on an album we just mentioned, Ringo the Fourth. 
So we talk a little bit about that, and um, that's going to be posted on our YouTube channel uh, starting next Monday, which is the 16th of September. Also on my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, um, the most recent interview is with Gary Burr. This is another interview with Gary. Gary's known for all of his years working with Ringo, although he's had a phenomenal career as a songwriter in the country music field. Do I have the book here? Yes, I do. He just released this book, which I've talked about here on this show called Reunion. It's a fan fiction book about a Beatles reunion concert with all four of them in 1998. John was never killed in 1980, and they get together as a tribute to Linda McCartney, who had passed away that year. And it's a, a real fun read. We talk a lot about this book without giving too much away. And I am giving copies of this book away on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, just like I am the Tom Evans CD. I am myself right here. Um, my website, there's Beatles trivia every couple of weeks. And there's um, one of 10 prizes that you can win, including this uh, this new book. I've been raving about this. I don't know if you heard about it. It's called Dark Horse Records. We have one copy to give away and, um, you know, you could win it. So here is the author on our show. And if you like what you're hearing, you can win a copy of Dark Horse Records from Aaron Badgley. Autograph. Um, Autograph. What's that? Autographed. Okay. Even more right there. Um, and what else? My radio show, Every Little Thing, is airing on some 50 radio stations around the world. But if you want to listen to it, the easiest way, the only place where it's on demand is on WFDU's website, WFDU.FM. Look up their archival page, type in the words every little thing, and they have the most recent two shows that they aired on the radio station, which you can listen to throughout the week. And I think that's everything. Hey, Darren. All righty. Well, you can uh, listen to me on WFUV in New York City, 90.7 FM, um, or uh, you can listen anywhere around the globe on our website, WFUV. Dot org, or we have an app you can download and listen to us on the app. And I am on the air Monday through Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning, and Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4, so six days, five days a week. Um, on WFUV on Facebook, I have two pages like one, friend the other, and I'll hook you up. We'll end up, you'll end up on both pages. Um, and uh, and that's it basically for me. Let me just uh, say, and I guess I'll mention this because I brought up Facebook. It's official now. Our Facebook page is uh, the one known as Things We Said Today Video. What did I say? Call it Video Podcast, I believe. Video Things podcast. We Said Today Video Podcast with our new logo, courtesy of Anthony Giacone. And uh, that's what's our profile picture. That's the page. The old, there are two old pages that still are floating out there. They will be destroyed. Mark my words. Um, uh, but come to our new page, and Ken posts lots of stuff about his shows and his activities. And I try to remember to put Beatle News up there. Callan and Ken do as well, and that'll be our central, um, central place for uh, all things things we said today on Facebook. Okay. And for me, uh, I have two Facebook pages, uh, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, and there is also a McCartney Legacy Facebook page, which I guess as it gets closer to uh, uh, publication, we'll have some more stuff on it. But what we do put on is if we find out that, for instance, Amazon has it on sale because you, they, they've had sale prices for the uh, pre-order, uh, we always put that on so that people can, um, you know, take advantage of that. Um, you can contact all of us here at Things We Said Today at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. You could write to me directly at alancozen at gmail.com. Um, you can follow us on the app formerly known as Twitter 
uh, at, at Things We Said Fab. And uh, there is, as Darren said, our Facebook page, Things We Said Today video podcast, where we post the shows and information, and Ken posts information about things going on on his various uh, websites and other endeavors and uh, uh, yeah, all kinds of good stuff. So tune in. So um, it was great having Aaron. Um, we've we've been working on this, you know, in various ways ever since we met at uh, at Fest last February. Yeah, and uh, shared a cab to the airport, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm glad we were finally able to do it. Thank you so much. I, this has been a blast. Thank you guys so much. I'm a big fan of, as I said, what you guys do. So I listen to you online too, Darren. So yeah, I'm trying. Oh, thank that. you. Thank you. Thank oh. you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, appreciate that. Thank you very much. And yeah, I'm glad we got to do this. And, you know, I, before I was starting to say, in this sea of all these Beatle books that have been coming out, it's always Ooh. refreshing when somebody hits a topic that has not been touched on, mm -hmm. you know, and it sounds like you've got a couple more coming where you have found, uh, you know, the areas that have fallen through the cracks. Uh, so I look forward to your upcoming books and love the fact that this book exists. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's it. Thank you for your time, Aaron. Appreciate it. And there is always more to learn about the Beatles. That's the bottom line. That's right. Oh. For Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.